First of all, we want to make healthy choices in Ramadan. So. And I'd like you to notice in the picture, there's a beautiful table there of iftar foods. And I'm guessing it's Turkish because of the tea. That particular kind of teacup is typical of Turkey. But next to it, there's a beautiful glass of water. In front, there's a bowl of soup. Very common uh, in many parts of the Muslim world, different kinds of soup. And behind the soup is a salad. And then we see bread and we see... Uh, olives and um, other veggies from the Middle East and other kind of bread on the right, all kinds of wonderful things to break fast. One of the most wonderful things about Ramadan is it brings us together. I know we see our friends and family more during Ramadan than the rest of the year because everyone's inviting you to an iftar, you're inviting everyone to an iftar, and so on. But the picture on the upper left, who's ever gone for Umrah or for Hajj knows that's Masjid and Nabawi. Can you imagine the Masjid and Nabawi being just full of people breaking fast during Ramadan? And I saw other pictures outside the whole patio area, or whatever the outside is called, filled with people as well. And there's so much barakah also in feeding people for iftar. So if you're able to and you invite people, um, that's a wonderful thing. But in addition, consider doing a potluck where everyone brings a dish so you don't have to do much more than get the kitchen ready and maybe make the main dish. And as in the photo at the bottom, bring invite non-Muslim friends as well as Muslim friends. It's so important for people to know us and to know about Ramadan and to know about Islam. And uh, it breaks down barriers and it may make people curious about this religion, inshallah. Oops, sorry, I'm learning how to use this. So we need to thank Allah for the food, and sometimes we don't think about all the people that Allah has put in our path who bring us the food, like the woman who's planting the uh, rice seedlings in the rice paddy, or the people in California who are picking our crops. And of course, the bee. Without the bee, we would not have 80% of the foods that we have. The bees pollinate 80% of the fruits and the vegetables. And we know there's a lot of colony loss because of the modern chemical agriculture. They're spraying herbicides and pesticides, and they may consider the bee a pest, but we know that Allah has put the bee there for so many important reasons. And the Surah An-Nahal talks about the bee as well. So... I want to think about some things about food. It's, it's a blessing from Allah. And when we think of it, however, the very first sin was Adam and Eve disobeying and eating something that Allah said don't eat. So there's probably a lot of depth and we need some scholars to give us some good insights about that. But I was thinking, isn't that interesting? Allah blesses us with the food, but on the, the first thing we did wrong was to eat what we were told not to eat. And so food connects us to Allah and also to, um, in many ways, and also to people. The Prophet ﷺ said to eat and drink, but not in excess. And the question is, what are we doing when we hear of people eating from when the time they get up until the time they go to bed? And that's really a source of a lot of the poor health and the epidemic of chronic illnesses that we see around us. The Prophet ﷺ also recommended not to eat, fill our stomachs with meat to, the, to excess. And in fact, he ate meat about once every 40 days. Um, maybe we want to eat meat more often than that, but do we need to eat meat every day? Do we need to eat meat every other day? Uh, let's see if we can't cut down on that and increase um, the vegetarian foods instead. So the question is, is meat really healthy for us? And are we, is it healthy for us to eat it every day? And then are we allowing Allah's guidance? Um, are we following Allah's guidance on what to eat? So I've included some ayahs from Quran because I think it's important as a, as a um, beginning. O oh, you who believe, eat what is wholesome and from what we have provided you and express your gratitude to Allah. If you worship and serve none other than him, say, lawful unto you are all things good and pure, tayyib, and what you have taught your hunting animals to catch in the manner directed to you by God. This day all things good and pure are made lawful to you. And the earth has he shaped for the living creatures. In it there are fruit and date palms of many varieties with sheathed clusters and grains 
with husks and herbs that with scent. Then which of the bounties of your rub do you deny, O humans and jinn? And we bring forth from it crops of which you eat, and we make in it gardens of dates and grapes, and we cause springs to gush forth from it, so that they eat the fruits thereof. Lo, this is, I purposely put this in bold, it is not their hands that produce them, Allah is telling us. Therefore will they not be thankful. And of the fruit, dates, and grapes, you make sweets, sakara, of them, and healthful food. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who reason. Eat what is good, tayyib, and in the few of the ayahs, the word pure or wholesome was translated. And tayyib refers to things that are pure, clean, wholesome, and nourishing. So I'm asking, could this be said about processed food, factory-made food, fast food, junk food? Is there anything tayyib about it? And what food has baraka in it? Because when we eat, we want that baraka as well. And so when cooking, think about saying duas, even just a simple bismillah as you're stirring the pot, which we have to do once in a while when we're cooking. And when we sit down to eat. And of course, remember Allah that has, has provided us with everything we need in life, including good food to be healthy. So we have to start asking ourselves if we have any illness problems, if we have signs of any disease, or if we even have of the beginnings of a chronic illness, what is it we can eat to get healthy again? Now, some people think they can neglect suhoor, but that means going almost 24 hours or 22 hours in a day during Ramadan without food or water or drinking. So first, this is Prophet Ibrahim's words um, that Allah wants us to learn from. He who created me and he who guides me and he who feeds me and quenches my thirst and when I am sick, he heals me. So Allah is always the healer. We have to do the work to change what we're eating if we're not eating things that we know, are not, if, we're, if we're not eating things that are tayyib, but Allah is the one who is actually going to do the healing for us. Oh, you who believe fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may learn self-restraint and taqwa. And eat and drink, and this is the important, I've highlighted these words specifically, and eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct to you from the black thread of night. Then complete the fast until the sunset. And the, the unfortunate thing is when many years ago, there were many new Muslims in America who didn't know about suhoor, and they would basically be fasting, having iftar, and then fasting until the next iftar. And people would actually be collapsing and fainting on the street. And partly also because if you have a breakfast with sugar, whether it's donuts, uh, pastries, cake, cookies, sugar in tea or coffee, any of these things will immediately raise your blood sugar. The insulin is produced. It takes that blood sugar and forces the, sh the glucose into the cells. And now suddenly our energy goes down and our hunger goes up. And insulin is the hunger enzyme. So people that are eating any kind of sugar for suhoor, this Ramadan, try not to at all, and you will find that, number one, you feel full for many more hours, and two, you will not feel lightheaded, and you'll actually be much healthier. So, three special words, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Here are some examples, soup, uh, juices or smoothies, uh, fruit salad. All of these are foods with lots of fluid, which is the first thing we want to replace when we, um, we break our fast. And also, we can have any of these in the morning as well for suhoor. Um, I know a lot of friends like to have, especially Indian Pakistani community, pakora and samosa. Maybe cut down to one piece. Maybe cut down to just a couple of times a week. Because what is that? It's fried food. And we'll have to talk about good fats and bad fats a little later. And it's flour, especially if it's samosa. And if it's filled with potato. And maybe a few green peas scattered about. That's really not the way to break a fast at all. And then the next three special words are fiber, 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 a piece of broiled chicken, lots of veggies, and you're getting a lot of fiber because the fiber is not in the animal foods. The fiber is only in the fruits and vegetables and in beans, in seeds, in nuts, fresh fruit, dried fruit. And the picture on the right basically does it. The back of the picture shows lots of fruit, 
you can see some broccoli on either side of the picture and in the front all kinds of seeds and nuts things you can have at the beginning of your meal or at the end of the meal excuse me please wait until I finish because then I'll have to comment to you and yeah we'll have plenty of time for question and answer so I mentioned about fats we want to eat good fats and avoid the bad fats the bad fats are what you find in processed food the ideal is to have a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-3 omega fats to omega-6 fats, the good fats to the bad fats. A little bit of omega-6 is not a bad thing, but the American diet is particularly overbalanced. Uh, anything from 16 to 1 to 25 to 1 of bad to good ratio. And the processed food and junk foods use only the bad fats, which leads to disease down the road. What are the bad fats we're talking about? things that are called vegetable oils, and some of them aren't even from vegetables. Cotton seed oil is coming from cotton. Nobody eats that, right? No one eats cotton. And sunflower and safflower oil, those are coming from flowers. Again, not a vegetable. And the other ones, the corn, the soybean, and the, is it on there? Uh, canola oil, right up on top. Those three are typically genetically modified, so they're also causing a lot of damage to every organ of our body. And what are the good fats? butter and ghee, and ghee is clarified butter, coconut oil, avocado oil, olive oil, fish oil is omega-3s. If you get it in a capsule, you're taking it as a supplement. I wouldn't fry food with fish oil, but as a supplement, it's certainly okay. And eggs are here, but I think of that more as a protein. And Allah is the one that heals us, to just remember. I, I thought the the concern of a father for a child uh, or a mother for a child is, is something that we can't really always put into words, but you want to see your child healthy. You want to see your child grow up to be normal. And so once again, Allah's um, surah, uh, ayah from surah 26, he who created me and he who guides me and he who feeds me and quenches my thirst and when I am sick, he heals me. This is the most important ayah to remember that when we're sick, it's Allah that we ask for healing, and Allah is the one that does the healing. The doctor is working for Allah, not for himself. He may think he's working for, or she working for herself, but the doctor is basically doing the work for Allah. And natural foods have multiple healing benefits. However, if you eat the standard American diet, which initials are SAD, you get the standard American diseases. This is all 20th century, 21st century truths. The SAD diet is inflammatory. And now all the research coming out is showing that the basis of all the chronic illnesses is inflammation in our body. Processed food, the fast food, the junk food, the bad fats, uh, lots of sugary things, all the things that are creating inflammation in our body are the basis then for diabetes, which could eventually lead to cancer or heart disease or Alzheimer's um, and certainly all the autoimmune diseases. That's because the SAD diet is acidic, creates an acidic environment in our body, which lets the bad bacteria grow in our intestinal tract. So there's no space left for the good bacteria. And what happens then is it leads to all kinds of chronic illnesses as are listed on the slide. The SAD diet destroys our health while the food industry makes profit. And that's the real reason of why don't they do uh, take those things out if they know that the, those things are unhealthy. You can't make money if you're the food industry uh, if everything is healthy. And then, of course, we may not need as many doctors, as many operations, as many pills to take, as many painkillers. All those things will just pretty much start going away. So processed foods make us sick, but notice how colorful they are. And it's those colors they've done research studies to find out what are the colors that most attract people. We know those bright colors are something children love. They have those crayons, or nowadays they have markers. All those bright colors. Clothes should have bright colors. Paint your walls bright colors. But artificial colors should not be something we're putting in our body. Allah's food also has beautiful colors, and those are the ones we should get used to and raise our children with. Now, we used to think food was just calories. If you eat enough food, you get enough calories, that's fine. But now we know food is information, and it turns the genes on in the body, good genes, or it can turn the good genes off and turn the bad genes on. So what we eat is actually 
directly affecting our health. Only 5% of diseases are actually genetic in origin, so we can heal our body. And I've seen many people heal from very serious chronic illnesses. We tend to eat what we grew up with. So the question is, are we ready to change to healthy eating? Oops, sorry. So watch out for things called health foods that have genetically modified ingredients, or GMOs, or genetically modified organisms, is what the O stands for. Anytime you see a label on a box or a jar or any food or food-like substance that says health food or natural ingredients, you know it's a lie. It's a lie because what they put in there, they want mothers to think, oh, this is healthy. Or children will say, oh, this candy, mommy, look, it says it's healthy for me. It's a way of twisting our arms to buy what the kids want us to buy when we know they're really not healthy. So we've got to watch out for this message on the food labels that is really the opposite of the truth. Salad dressing, veggie burgers, protein shakes, even whole wheat bread uh, as have many genetically modified ingredients, especially the artificial sugars or um, uh, like aspartame, uh, which is used in low sugar foods. I forgot if it's the little blue or the little pink thing, but it's actually known to cause cancer. So we have to think about what we're eating. And most of, or 80% of, of the processed food, of the factory made food has either corn, uh, corn oil, or corn syrup solids where they've chemically changed the corn from a starch to a, a sugar because it's cheap. Or it has oil, usually either corn oil or soybean oil or canola oil. And those are things that are typically genetically modified. So these processed foods are all leading to disease, but they're leading to huge profits. So someone is getting an economic benefit and other people are getting health problems, which is most of us. Processed foods with GMOs. About, as I said, about 80% of all processed food have GMO ingredients. All commercial baked goods, whether you go to the supermarket or to the most expensive bakery, it's still going to be the same thing. They have GMO sugar and the sugar beets. There are nine major crops right now in the U.S. that are genetically modified and they're working on more. Uh, but when you see something like sugar, <clears throat> If you go to the supermarket and you see a bag of, a bag of sugar uh, that says 100% pure sugar, and then there's another bag next to it, and it says 100% cane sugar. You say, well, why is the cane sugar more? They're both 100%. Cane sugar is coming from sugar cane. The other one that says pure sugar is pure beet sugar from sugar beets, and that's all genetically modified. So if you're going to have sugar at all, in tea or coffee or in making desserts, you at least want to be sure it's coming from cane sugar and not something that's 100% pure sugar because that's not what you're really getting. So candy bars, ice cream, the snack foods, um, they all are loaded with the GMO sugar, uh, the GMO oils, additives, uh, artificial flavors, and something called natural flavors are also artificial. If it's a real natural flavor, it will tell you what, what it is. Like it may say um, peppermint oil. That's coming from the peppermint plants, and the oil has been extracted. That's different than saying a natural flavor, which is also artificial. But there's some, some rule where you can get away with calling things natural. So remember, you want to watch out for natural and, and healthy on, on the labels of, of uh, food products. So... Do you know what's in your pizza, your hamburger buns, your favorite processed foods and snacks? Can you find the GMO ingredients? I've got a couple of samples we're going to look at in a minute. And a lot of the ingredients on the list you can't even pronounce. The question is, if you can't pronounce it, could it even be food? Of course not. Those are chemicals for all kinds of reasons, because if the food is really boring in taste, by adding these various chemicals, they can fool our taste buds. We think, oh, this tastes really good but it's actually a chemical. So the best is to buy the organic version of a prepared food, and even better, cook it at home. There's nothing as good as home cooking for many reasons, including the baraka that you put into it. Now, most of us want to have halal meat, but what about feedlot meat? What is that? 
Most of the animals that are raised for slaughter, whether it's beef, lamb, goat, I wouldn't talk about the ones that are haram, but they're basically raised in uh, what are called factory farms. If the picture here is very typical, they're basically caged. Cows are supposed to graze on grasses. Instead, they're being fed corn, which is genetically modified. Uh, traditionally, uh, uh, cattle would be raised for about five years before slaughter. And now they're about a year and a half or under two years of age. And they're also, they need a lot of antibiotics because corn is not natural for them. And there's so much antibiotics put into the animal feed to keep them from dying and to keep them from infecting one another that many people are now becoming allergic uh, to antibiotics that they may need when they have a bacterial infection. It doesn't seem to work. And then the other question is, so what do we mean by halal? So there are a lot of benefits, uh, on the other hand, of eating vegetarian foods. And every Muslim cuisine has lots of very um, varied and delicious vegetarian dishes, whether they're made from beans or lentils, things with um, veggies, sauces made by grinding up nuts. People have been very creative over many centuries, and we have the benefit. Not only that, if we don't even have a cookbook, there's always uh, the internet to find out recipes for whatever thing we just bought at the store that we're trying out. So some of the other benefits of vegetarian food, there's a, there's a lot of fiber in them and they're nutrient rich. When there's a lot of fiber, you feel full for a long time. So you naturally lose weight and you're never feeling really hungry. And then we can enjoy the tremendous variety of plant foods that Allah has, has put here on the earth for us to eat. Did you know there's no human requirement for sugar? If you read what Dr. Mark Hyman has said on, on, the, on the left side, that sugar is eight times as addictive as cocaine. It is very hard to get off of eating sugar. So the question is, how many of us are sugar addicts? Ramadan is a wonderful time to break the habit because we're not eating all day. And it takes about four or five days to be completely sugar-free, 100% sugar-free, not a few little bits of it in, in a cup of tea or coffee or wherever, or a little taste of something, we can actually get off the sugar. And I've been off of sugar for a number of years, but I know if I taste some, it's very hard. You have to go through this whole detoxification to get off the sugar once again. And about 100 years ago, this may not be true of India, where um, we know Ghana, sugar cane is, is a native uh, crop. But about 100 years ago, people in America consumed about five pounds of sugar a year. And now people are consuming at least 150 pounds of sugar a year. A can of soda has 12 teaspoons of sugar. One can. How many teenagers do you see drinking more than one can? Several cans. Or people sitting, working on a computer all day, and they've got a soda next to them. And without thinking, they finish that one and get another one. Or inviting people for an iftar and serving soda. I used to serve soda. I grew up with it. And then I thought... We're not eating soda. We're not drinking soda anymore. Why would I serve my guests something that I know is so unhealthy? We're not eating it. I can't mistreat my guests. So that was the end of soda. It's just the thinking process. It's not always easy to give up something that we've made a habit or growing up with the habit, no less. There was water in my mother's kitchen, but somehow it was always soda at dinner time. I have no idea why. Okay, so the GMO sugar beets and the GMO corn syrup solids have replaced sugar in many foods, and the damage is to every organ of the body with the genetically modified food. Now, I did mention before, but I'll say it again, no sugar for Sephora. Absolutely not a drop of sugar in tea or coffee either. Otherwise, you will feel hungry in a couple of hours. You'll think, oh, I ate all that biryani that was left over from last night. It was so good. Maybe I didn't eat enough because two hours later, why do I feel hungry? And the rest of the day, it's a challenging fast. Whereas if you eat... Uh, something made with beans, uh, even a lentil soup, uh, some kind of an oatmeal dish, or other cooked cereal, but oatmeal in particular um, is low on the glycemic index. It doesn't raise your blood sugar very high. All these things are very filling, and they're wonderful for suhoor, along with fruit, which again has a lot of fiber, or leftover veggies, maybe with some sauce on it. But it's all a matter of starting to think about how to change what we eat, and our children are very important. I'm glad we have some young people here who are learning uh, how to eat really healthy. So 
Here is a list, which you can't really read because it's too small, about 75 different names for sugar. So if you look at an ice cream container and you see all these things, you know, I don't know what this means. Most of these things you don't even know, aside from the real chemicals down below, but the ones at the upper half of the ingredient list are various forms of sugar that are disguised with different names. If they all said sugar, then the sugar would be higher than the cream in the ice cream. And we'd say, oh, we're eating a little cream with our sugar, and it's cold. So we're going to read some labels in a minute. Do you know what's in Cool Whip? Do you know what's in Cremora? Do you know what's in the cakes that you buy from the supermarket? Unfortunately, we don't have an ingredient list when we go to the bakery, but most people buy things from the supermarket. And so I call these food-like substances that we're eating, and more likely than not, the food-like substances are going to result in a chronic illness. When I hear someone at after Jumar prayer saying, please pray for so-and-so, he's going into for surgery for double bypass, triple bypass, quadruple bypass, and the man is in his 40s. This is horrible. This is eating the wrong way for all those years. That should be something that ha happens at the end of life or never. If people are eating healthy, they shouldn't have these problems. Okay, so here's the cream aura label. It has the word cream in the name of the product. So it's so attractive. But when you read the label, the first thing it says on the three lines is non-dairy. No milk, right? Non-dairy. But it's called cream more to put in your coffee. What's the first ingredient? That's a form of sugar, right? But it's the genetically modified corn syrup solids. And you know what happens with corn syrup solids. The body says, well, this isn't sugar. And it's not corn, which is a starch. So what is it? Well, we'll just stuff it away in the closet until we figure out what to do with it. And you know what the closet in the body is? The fat cells. And the fat cells keep growing because the closet got to hide all that stuff somewhere. And this is what's happening to the epidemic of obesity in our country. Then we've got hydrogenated coconut or palm and or palm kernel. Hydrogenated means when you put the hydrogen back in, you take a liquid oil and you make it a solid fat. And that is something that um, is very damaging to the body as well. And again, once again, um, it gets stored away in the closet. Then there's something called sodium caseinate. Casein is actually milk protein. But sodium caseinate, they're calling it a milk derivative. You know, it's like someone says, well, cocaine, it's actually from a plant. What could be bad? So we have to think about how words are being used to manipulate us. And, and most people don't even read these labels. Anyone who knows what the other things are on that label? And there's the natural and artificial flavors and artificial colors, of course. Ice cream. Now this is um, Dryers Home Office College Avenue in Oakland. And you see it in all the supermarkets. But when we look at the ingredient list, I wonder how many sugars are on there? How about hydrogenated oils, GMO ingredients, artificial ingredients, titanium dioxide, which is also even in toothpaste, and it's put in a lot of things to make them very white and bright, is now shown to be a possible carcinogen causing cancer. This is really dangerous. So you can buy an ice cream machine for people that love ice cream. You can buy it as an Eid gift for families that have a lot of children and they want ice cream now and again. You just put in about five ingredients. That's all that's needed to make ice cream. Not this big, long list of things. OK, there's, I think it's the next one I, that has another thing I want to show you. Sara Lee cake. And what does the cake say under Sara Lee? All butter pound cake. That sounds wonderful. And maybe it was originally all butter. Everything was called a pound cake because it was a pound of flour, a pound of sugar, a pound of butter, and whatever else. When it was a pound, a pound, a pound, that's how it got its name. So the first thing is enriched bleached flour. And in parenthesis are certain B vitamins that were removed. And then they had to enrich it, but never the same as what it originally was, the, the wheat that Allah uh, provided us. Then we see sugar. But it doesn't tell us what kind of sugar. If it says cane sugar, you know it's from sugar cane. But if it says sugar, what is it? Corn or sugar beets, but genetically modified. And again, the body doesn't know what to do it, so do with it so it 
continues to get stored in the closet. Then we have high fructose corn syrup, another form of sugar. Then we have mono and diglycerides, which are chemicals, not natural. And let's see, modified corn starches. Corn starch isn't bad enough, which is a GMO, but they've modified it in the factory. So one more chemical thing going into our body. There's the artificial flavor. Now the artificial flavor, it looks like the word vanilla, but it's actually vanillin. It's spelled just a little differently. Vanillin is actually a chemical that you make in the laboratory. It smells and tastes like vanilla. It's cheap and it's a highly toxic chemical for the brain. And if you see children at a birthday party, in the beginning they're really calm, they can't wait to eat everything. By the end of the party, if they've had things with vanillin in the cake or in the ice cream, they're really running around. You see these kids are really just <laughs> flipping out. This is exactly what's happening. This is a very dangerous chemical and it should be banned from food, but it's not. So here's the result of GMO foods, disease, is the bottom line. The GMO crops were first introduced in the 1990s uh, because of the money of big ag. They got pushed through without being any, any testing on people to find out are they safe, are they not safe. So there's a, this was taken from a study of about 22 different diseases that they looked at. What you see, it starts with 1980 and about 1994, uh, it suddenly starts to climb rapidly. The uh, red line is the genetically modified corn and soy. I'm sorry, the blue line and the, the red line is the glyphosate. That's the chemical, one of the active chemicals in Roundup. Now, the green line on the bottom shows had there not been the GMO foods it would have continued to rise the prevalence of diabetes, but very slowly, because there are other things in our American diet that are really not that healthy. But the sudden rise, and you'll see in the next few slides as well, the sudden rise of the genetically modified, uh, of diseases because of genetically modified foods, along with the glyphosate, what's in the Roundup chemical, we see this rapid increase in disease. These are a few more slides just showing some of the other diseases. Everything started to change around 1994, 95. The green line, and I'm sorry, the two on the bottom are actually the same slide, which I corrected later, but um, these are different kinds of cancer. The same is um, for hypertension, and that's deaths from hypertension. This is what is happening to our diet. Even so, the green line on the bottom shows it was still progressing rather rapidly, but there are a lot of other reasons for hypertension as well. And the saddest thing is the slide on the right, the number of children with autism. I never even heard of the word autism as a child. We never saw anybody with autism. It was an unheard of thing. And now it's ubiquitous. And more boys than girls seem to get it. And African-American boys seem to get it in even higher um, levels. So it's a serious problem. We need to avoid genetically modified foods and we need to also watch out for the bad fats and think about substituting the good fats. So this is what Roundup looks like when you go to the store, whether it's Home Depot or uh, some other uh, store, gardening shop. And it's actually patented as an antibiotic. And here's the problem. There's been a huge increase in food allergies, food intolerances, and people allergic to foods that previously they could eat without a problem. And mothers have said to me, I don't know, my child seems to be allergic to just everything. Then glyphosate, which is the main chemical in Roundup, and there are many other chemicals as well. It destroys the good bacteria in our gut, and it leaves the disease-causing bacteria to overgrow, which leads to the steep rise in the chronic illnesses we saw in those charts. Many people are now resistant to antibiotics needed to cure a bacterial infection. Why? The animals, about 80% of the antibiotics are used for the animals so they don't die from being in close quarters and because they're not supposed to be eating corn to start with. And the allergic reactions uh, with children is, is also connected uh, with the, um, the GMO foods.
Another thing I want to mention, if you buy food, read the label. I was looking once, garlic, you know, grows down a little in Hollister, right, south of San Jose. Lots of garlic. But if you're not careful, you might buy, I saw this at the store, garlic coming from China. Unfortunately, because they've been so eager to economically progress rapidly and catch up and get ahead of everyone else, they've paid no attention to how much they polluted the air, the water, and the land. And a number of years ago, the Department of Agriculture in the U.S. said, no more food from China unless it's organic. So the Chinese said, fine. So they relabeled the same food, organic, and it still comes into America. We don't want to feed these things to our children. If whatever you see a product, and it says, look for it, see if it says made in China, because there's a law that requires a product out, produced outside the U.S. to say what country it's coming from. And so this is a very serious thing, because in, in such a polluted country, nothing could possibly be organic. And I have nothing against Chinese food either, or China, but the food is my concern. So the thing is, bottom line, we want to eat a healthy diet. And most of our health problems, if they don't totally disappear, will make tremendous inroads on reversing those diseases. We've got a whole month that Allah gives us. And while we're reading Quran, while we're coming for prayers, we also need to think about what we're putting in our body because a portion of one hadith is that Allah wants or to us to be, what is it? A healthy Muslim is better than a sick Muslim. We don't want any sick Muslims. We don't need any sick Muslims. We only want healthy Muslims. And certainly we don't want to be praying for someone who goes for a double, triple, quadruple bypass when he could have known or she could have known about eating healthy and never getting sick. And when you eat healthy, we actually, the research is showing that people who are healthy, their hearts are actually younger. Their brains are actually younger than other people their age, younger by 15 or more years. This is dramatic. No one has to get Alzheimer's as an old person. It has so much to do with our lifestyle, but particularly what we're eating. So we want to avoid the GMO ingredients. We want to avoid additives and preservatives. We can't even pronounce them. Artificial ingredients and eat organic instead. So here are the main crops. Alfalfa, which is fed to the cattle. And the problem with alfalfa also, just like the corn, because it's genetically modified, if the animal is eating something that's making it sick, making its body unhealthy, how do we expect an unhealthy animal to give us health? We have to think about that. When we get food from the store, if that's halal, we don't think about how was the animal raised? What was it fed? Was it in a factory farm? Was it basically in a cage all of its life? This is not tayeb. We're not supposed to torture animals, and yet, because we don't see the animals, we don't live near farms, we live in cities, pretty much, we don't know what's going on. So here are some examples of common foods of corn. If you buy the organic version, some of these things are organic. You can get organic cornflakes, you pay more. But cornflakes, cornstarch, then modified corn syrup solids, that cannot be made organic. Corn chips, you can get organic at Trader Joe's. High fructose corn syrup, that's a no-no. Corn oil, I haven't seen any organic corn oil. But cornmeal, corn flour, you can get um, non-GMO. You can get organic. And soy, all the non-organic soy products, whether it's soy milk, soybean oil, soy protein isolate, which is uh, typically used in most of the veggie burgers, Soy lecithin, soy sauce, and I left out tofu and tempeh um, from the slide, but all of these things. So when we go and eat Chinese food, we say, oh, this, the tofu is okay because we know it's, it's halal. But it may be GMO. Most likely it is GMO. So we have issues. We need to learn if we, want, if we love Chinese food, we have to learn how to make it at home or take a course in how to make Chinese food authentically and then start cooking it if that's what you love. Canola oil, most all of it is GMO and sugar beets, as I mentioned before. So spraying toxic chemicals on food, it has to make food toxic. What else could it be? And we know that spraying all those um, pesticides on the bees are what's led to the, the colony, the bee colony loss. So organic food is free of pesticides and herbicides. It's free of GMOs. And it's what our ancestors, maybe our grandparents, and certainly our great-grandparents, just used to call food. Organic wasn't needed because everything was organic, and it doesn't make us sick. 
But sometimes, if we eat only organic, well, it's a lot of money. If someone is sick with a chronic illness, organic food is very, very important. But if they're basically healthy, the most you want to avoid are what's called the dirty dozen. The ewg.org, you should get that on, on an app or on your, um, on your email. And they have lots of lists of also other products, um, beauty products, cleaning products, and so on. ewg.org. They come out every year with the dirty dozen. It changes a little bit each year. The list is updated um, based on the current data of crops provided by the Department of Agriculture. These are herbicides and pesticides you can't wash off. You can't scrub them off. You can't put them in soapy water. These vegetables or fruits will not get healthy. Now, kale has been on the list since the year 2020, and everyone hears kale is a health food. If it's organic, it's a health food like a lot of other foods. If it's not organic, it's deadly. So in the order, the worst one is strawberries. There are more than 30 different um, chemicals that are sprayed on strawberries. But then there's spinach, and then there's kale, collards, and mustard greens, nectarines, apples, grapes, um, bell peppers and all the hot chili peppers, cherries, peaches, pears, celery, and tomatoes. And this year, 2023 list just came out this week. I don't have a pretty photo. They haven't come up with that yet. Blueberries and green beans are now on the list as well. So the, you can eat other things that are not organic. And it's not, I'm talking about fruits and vegetables. It's not going to cause a lot of, you're not going to be eating a lot of pesticides and herbicides. But these particularly are the worst ones that really should be organic. So the question is, how many changes are you willing to make this Ramadan? Are you willing to reverse your age internally? Are you willing to eat healthier? Are you willing to remember Allah and thank Allah for giving us good, wholesome food, food that's tayeb, that we can eat, that will give us the strength uh, to enjoy the fasting every day and have more energy by the end of the month? That's pretty important. So here are some simple substitutes we can make. If you're having a sugary drink as part of your iftar, or if you're having fruit drink, fruit drink is only 10% juice, and the rest is sugar and water. So you can drink water, or you can juice, drink pure juice. You could even take watermelon, get, rid of, get the ones without the pits, and make a watermelon um, drink, or a lessi with watermelon, and maybe some yogurt. You can increase the number of vegetarian dishes at each meal or the freak and the frequency, how often you say, we won't have meat tonight. We're just going to have some wonderful vegetarian dishes. And there are umpteen recipes available everywhere. And reducing meat consumption, meaning when you eat meat, how about cutting in half, eating half what we used to eat and not eating it as many times a week, maybe just on the weekend, maybe just when we invite friends for an iftar. And then the sweet desserts, we can always have fruit. We can always have more dates. We can make a smoothie. Banana is a good base for a sweetening of, of, the, uh, of a smoothie and then adding other fruits in with it. And the most important thing, as I said before, avoiding any kind of sugar at all at Sahur. Oops, sorry, one more. Oop, we just did that. So nutritious food versus processed food. Are you choosing health or disease this Ramadan? There's that line between the two of them. And so are you going to go for the food on the left, the food on the right, or just reduce the food on the right gradually? Because if we trained our family to like processed food, it may not be that easy to get rid of it all at once. So sometimes small changes mean permanent changes. And doing things all at once sometimes mean you get a lot of resistance in the family. So you know your family, you know your cooking style, you know the ages of your children and of your spouse, and it's up to you to decide what you want to do to change. But this is, these little changes will make a big difference in our lives and keep us healthier, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much. Now I'll entertain any questions there are. And there's a microphone coming around. If you have a question, you can just pass it around. Uh, 
Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum. Uh, I have one question regarding uh, oil. As you mentioned, like we cannot use uh, canola oil. So which oil is uh, good for uh, cooking? Usually I'm just uh, using uh, olive oil. But uh, is there any other option for us, please? Okay. So olive oil actually uh, has a much lower smoking temperature. Uh, it's not good for high heat cooking. You certainly can't. Uh, the best thing is to use it with salads. Um, cooking oil, some of the best ones are avocado oil, and there are two good brands. Some of them are corrupted, but one is called Chosen, and the other one is Nutiva. Nutiva is actually made in the Bay Area. Um, and then there's coconut oil. You know, in the summertime, coconut oil is a liquid, and when it gets to be cold in the wintertime in the house, we don't keep our house at 80 degrees in the winter. I don't think anyone could afford the bill, the, the heating bill. Um, so coconut oil is a wonderful thing to cook with. And these things you can get organic very easily. Uh, there's also ghee. Yeah. Um, but that's a little expensive. But, you know, you're making a biryani and you put a little bit on top. Um, who's to say no thank you? So these are the, the best ones. Um, and there's, uh, the other oils would not be for cooking, like the fish oil would be for supplements. There's also flaxseed oil, but again, that's a supplement because it's, it's a very powerful um, oil for healing our body. But I don't think anyone cooks with that. Good question. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, sometimes you talk about extra virgin olive oil. Is that different from olive oil? Okay. Olive oil that we buy in the store should say extra virgin. But there was a 2020 or 60 minute program years ago which showed that 95% of the olive oil coming in from Italy is controlled by the mafia. And it may not even be virgin olive oil. And it may only be 5% olive oil with cheap oil thrown in. And sometimes they even found food coloring to make it look like olive oil. So um, I know at Trader Joe's you can get oil from uh, the Kalamata olive oil from Greece. I've seen some from North Africa. Um, I don't know where we can get Turkish olive oil. We were recently, when we went for Umrah, we got some Turkish olive oil on Turkish Air Airlines. Uh, I don't know what other, what other countries. Uh, certainly California. California has a lot of olive oil. So the extra virgin is what we want for cooking. And it really should be not for heat cooking, but for salad cooking. Any other questions? Are there any questions coming in from the live stream? Not yet. Okay. I always thought ghee is bad. Bad means, you know, it has butter in it. You know, like it's made out of butter. The ghee. Can you hear me? Oh, you can always cook with ghee. The, the, the whole reason that ghee exists is because in a hot country, like in the subcontinent, you can't keep butter without refrigeration. And before the 20th century, there was no refrigeration. So with ghee, you evaporate off by heating it. You evaporate off the water, and you remove the milk solids right. as the sediment. And the ghee will keep for months and months and months. No, no, that's true. I'm just worried about the calories from the ghee. Uh, okay. All fat has approximately the same calories for the same quantity. So a tablespoon of every fat has about the same. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. One sec. One sec. Uh, you want? Okay. Uh, sometimes uh, we, when we buy milk, so they have uh, already have uh, some sweets like sugars. So that one is good for our body or no? Like the canned... Uh, Milk. Oh, canned milk. You're yes. talking about not evaporated milk, but sweetened condensed milk? Yes. Oh, it's loaded with sugar. Yeah. Sweetened condensed milk, yeah. It's, it's concentrated sugar, basically. It's kind of thick because it's really a sugar syrup. So in case if you drink uh, a cup of uh, one glass per day, is fine for our body or no? Oh, my God, no. You're no. going to be so overloaded with sugar, no. you'll fall asleep in the middle of the afternoon. No. <laughs> and if you're at work, you're going to be in real trouble. <laughs> so, no. Um, another thing I want to say about milk, because... Um, yeah. 
let me just say one thing, and then we want to hear from this young man, who I know has, can't wait to get his question out. Um, so when you really think of it, there's no other mammal besides humans that drinks milk after it's been weaned. No mammal drinks milk after it's been weaned. And I don't know what it is now, but the dairy industry is very powerful, powerful lobby. And so I know when I was a child, they said children should drink four cups of milk every day, and adults should drink two cups of milk every day. Well, I don't know what the quality of the milk was then, but I can tell you what the quality of the milk is now. If you're going to drink milk, it should be organic. For people that have, uh, are lactose intolerant, which is typical of many people in the subcontinent, and African Americans and Africans also, um, you want to get lactose-free, organic. If it's not organic, you've got a, a whole bunch of problems. These are coming from animals that are fed high levels, the, the, the cows are fed high levels of estrogen, so they produce milk all year long, including all through their pregnancy. Because normally mammals, if they're nursing a, a baby or a young animal, whatever, as the pregnancy proceeds, they produce so little milk that the animal, or for humans, the baby naturally weans. So instead, by flooding uh, uh, estrogen, female hormones, into the cows, they produce all the time because the dairy industry is an industry. They don't love the cows. They see it as a source of income. And so what is all that estrogen doing to the young boys? What is that doing to men? Is that, I don't know, but there seems to be indications, and I've heard from other nutritionists, the feminization of men. And we talk about gay men. So, you know, there are a lot of things that have to still be researched. So having milk occasionally is fine. Um, I don't think it's good even for boys to be given much milk after they're three or four years old, or maybe when they're weaned. But milk occasionally... Uh, in tea or coffee, uh, used in recipes, uh, and so on. I don't see that as a problem, but that's occasionally. And also, the countries with the highest consumption of dairy products, which also includes cheeses and yogurt, and this is England, the U.S., and a couple of the Scandinavian countries, they have the highest rate of broken bones and broken hips in older people, especially women. So all that milk, it's not the calcium we need, it's the vitamin D we need rather than the calcium because that's not the form of calcium we want unless we want a bunch of broken bones when we're old and then it's another kind of a problem. Now, we have this young man with a good question. Hold the microphone so we can hear. Um, so, like, w what if there's, like, a juice brand that says... It what? When... What if there is a juice brand that says it's 100% organic juice? I mean, not You want to know what juices are 100% juice? Organic. It said it said it said that it was 100% um juice, but when I looked at the ingredients it said like it said that it included high fructose corn syrup. Syrup. Yeah, I'm having trouble hearing, so I'm going to ask your mommy to uh, to tell me what you just asked. So he said when I looked into when I looked into the ingredient list of the, the typical 100% organic juice, so it says that uh, it, did, it didn't say it was organic 100% organic, but it said it was 100% juice. But it said it was 100% juice, but what was it when you looked carefully? When I looked into the ingredients, it said it had um, high fructose syrup, high fructose corn syrup. High fructose corn syrup. Well, that's not really good, is it? Right? It's pretty dangerous for our body. So we've got to read labels. And so when you go shopping with your mom, if you go shopping with her ever, you can be a great helper by reading labels. Right? What grade are you in? Third grade? Great. You can read labels, too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it looks like that's it on the questions. Has one come in from live stream? So there's 
Excellent question online. Should we limit our cheese intake? Should we limit our cheese in intake? Absolutely. Cheese, believe it or not, is one of the most addictive foods after sugar. Um, most cheeses are high fat. They're concentrated forms of milk. When you think of how much milk you have to, all the liquid in the milk to make the cheese. Um, and the high fat cheeses in particular are a problem. We want to reduce that to as little as, as infrequently as possible. I have nothing against cheese. It's delicious. Um, but if people are already sick, if they are heading in the direction of heart disease, um, hardening of the arteries, etc., that cheese is not very helpful. And if they're heading in the direction of cancer, um, milk actually is a growth kind of food, and cheese is a concentrated version of milk. So we want to limit the amount of cheese. A lot of people have allergic reactions, a lot of congestion in their nose, and they don't know what it's from. And they get a medicine from the doctor for the congestion, whereas actually it's too much cheese. We have cheese all the time. It's not just on pizza. It's on the spaghetti, and it's on... It's ubiquitous, and it's quesadillas, you know, cheese and a burrito, or, uh, and so on. So we really want to limit. And I think there's another young man with a question, but you'll have to hold the mic so I can hear you. Yeah, so... Yeah, like what milk is actually that you can drink that's actually organic and not part of the factory industry? You're asking, or you're, you're making a statement, right? That organic milk is different from regular milk. Which milk is good to drink? Well, you want to drink milk that's organic. But there are also other milks. There's almond milk, which is good. There's coconut milk, which has a lot of other amazing health benefits. So it doesn't just have to be cow's milk. And you might want to try some of that in your... Cereal, if you're having cereal in the morning. Uh, you might want to try some of those in making a dessert instead of regular milk because they have a lot of benefits that the cow's milk may not have. Okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. But organic is better. Okay, I think that's it on the questions. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Ramadan Mubarak to you. I know they're going to be sighting the moon here in the parking lot on Wednesday night. And the, they're going to have big telescopes. But the food trucks come first. And I told my husband, guess what? The food trucks are coming early. And he laughed. And we said, yeah, because the Muslims come out when the food is there. He said, you think they're giving it free? I said, no, it's the food trucks, but they'll probably be good food. So, so it's Halal Amigos and Halal Bite of Chicago's. Halal Amigos and Halal what? Bite of Chicago. Halal Bite of Chicago. Yeah, and MCC always encourages all the different Muslim restaurants, all the different Muslim um, food sellers of whatever kind to, to participate. We want everyone to, to come and be successful in their business and give us good food. So um, thank you once again for coming. And inshallah, we'll be fasting on Thursday morning. Assalamu alaikum. You have another question? OK. Come over here so I can hear you. Oh, and grab the microphone. So why are you excited if the food is like not healthy? Why am I excited? What? If the food is not healthy, why are we excited? No, we are excited to eat healthy food. What we could do if we go to a restaurant, we could ask them, could you have some organic things on the label, on, on, the, on the menu the next time? Because I like to eat organic. My mommy makes organic food for me. And then tell them what your favorite food is. Okay. Okay? Because restaurants like to serve food that people want to eat. Right? Okay. Thank you so much.